We're now going to finish the tutorial for simple assembly in the RISC-V instruction set architecture. We're going to explain how to implement function calls. To understand the mechanism for procedure calls or function calls, we first need to understand the call stack. The notion of a call stack is a dynamically allocated memory region that grows like a stack data structure. That is a last in first out or LIFO discipline. Some instruction set architectures have stacks that grow up toward larger addresses, and some, including RISC-V, allow software to decide which direction the stack grows. By default, RISC-V stacks grow down. The general purpose register with a mnemonic SP holds the current address of the top of the stack. SP stands for stack pointer. When the stack grows down, the stack pointer is actually the smallest address in the stack. All legitimate stack accesses will be greater than or equal to the SP when the stack grows down. The main way to add elements to the stack in RISC-V is the store word instruction. First, we need to make room on the stack to store the data. Add I decrements the stack pointer by X bytes usually a multiple of four to make room for X divided by four 32-bit words. With space available, the store word instruction can then be used to write the data from the source register operand to the memory location offset from the stack pointer. Removing data from the stack is done by modifying the stack pointer, usually by an add instruction. Before we free the space from the stack, you may or may not need to restore that data into a register. The load word instruction is used to copy four bytes from memory into the dest register operand if needed. The add i instruction can be used to pop the top of the stack, for example, by four bytes. Once the top of the stack moves upward, it is invalid to access the data that sits below the stack pointer. So we'll start by looking at how control flow goes through a procedure call. A call is made by first saving the return address to the RA register, which is X1 in RISC-V, and then jumping to the label at the start of the procedure. This is accomplished with the jump and link instruction. The return address is the address of the next sequential instruction in the program after the call instruction, which is PC plus four with 32-bit wide instructions. A procedure returns by jumping to the address in the return address or RA register using the jump and link register instruction. Here's a small source program we'll use to explain the general idea of procedure calls. Execution will begin in main, which will return the call to ABS add of arguments negative one and two. The abs add procedure has two input parameters, both integers. It makes two procedure calls and it returns an int. It calls the ABS function, which takes one int argument and returns an int. In the following, we'll look at the assembly and walkthrough execution of the program. Here's one possible disassembly of main. The first line makes room on the stack so that the second line can store the return address to it. The next two lines put the constant arguments negative one and two into the A0 and A1 argument registers. Here we make the procedure call to adds add. We'll look at that function next, but first let's see what will happen when it returns. Because main is going to return the same value returned by absad, the return value for main is already in the right register A0. So the next instruction restores the return address from the stack before returning to it. Now let's see what happens in the absad function. As with main, the first instruction adjusts the stack pointer, but this time by minus 12 to make room for three registers of storage and then saves the return address onto the stack. The next two instructions are saving the other two registers on the stack, S0, which we need to save because it is callee saved register, and A1, which holds the value for Y. We need to save the argument register for Y because it is a caller saved register, and we need to preserve its value over the first sub procedure call to ABS. Then we make the call with jump and link. Because X is still in A0, we don't have to do anything to make sure the right argument gets passed through. And we'll look at the abs function in just a minute. After the first call to abs returns, we copy the return value into register S0 using an add instruction with zero. This gets the absolute value of X into S0. 
Then we load back the value of y into the a0 argument register before we make the second call to abs. When that returns, we have absolute value of y in the return register a0, and absolute value of x is in s0. So we add them together, putting the result into a0 for the return value. The last four instructions restore the value of the callie save register s0 in the return address from the stack, adjust the stack back to its original value, and return to the caller. Finally, here's the assembly for abs, which we looked at previously. Abs does not itself make any procedure calls, so it will not need to save the return address on the stack. We call a function that doesn't make any function calls a leaf function. Since we talked through this code generation before, we can just move on. Let's have a look through the disassembled code of our two non-leaf procedures. Here we can see that the instruction pointer points to the address of the jump and link abs add instruction. At this point in time, the stack pointer is at some value 11c in hexadecimal, and the return address register is at hexadecimal 40001c for the return value to return from main. The jump and link copies the next instruction's address to the return address register so that the procedure call to abs add will return to the next instruction in the program following the call from main. The call finishes by changing the program counter to the address of the abs add label, which is the address of the first instruction in the sub procedure. That first instruction of abs add makes room on the stack for three registers by decrementing the stack pointer. So the top of the stack now points to address 110. We call each part of the stack associated with a given function call a stack frame, shown here as the memory up to the dashed line. This is also called an activation record. After the store word completes, the return address has been saved in the stack. After the return from the two sub procedure calls to abs, the return address points into the abs add function. So before we can return from abs add, we have to restore the return address so we wind up back in main. We also need to make sure we return to main with the stack pointer pointing back to the bottom of main's stack frame. So the load word writes to the RA register from the address that we previously stored it to at the start of abs add. And when abs add returns, it will go back to the instruction following the call in main with the stack pointer at the same address as when the call was made. Here we have the full set of general purpose registers color coded to show which are callee saved and caller saved. Remember that a callee saved register needs to be saved in a function before modifying it and restored to its original value before returning. A caller saved register needs to be saved in a function before calling another function if you want to preserve the value in that register after the sunken function returns. Typically, these registers are saved on the stack, although they can also be saved in a register of the other kind. Uh, a caller saved register can be saved in a callee saved register and vice versa. Sometimes a function will do that by saving a callee saved register like S0 at the start of the function and then using S0 to save some caller saved registers that need to survive a function call. Now we'll revisit the pop count function from our earlier discussion on loops, but implement it as a simple recursive function. Here is the high level code and the assembly implementation. The basic logic is to mask the least significant bit of the input argument with one and add it to the recursive sum from shifting the input by one. We'll walk through each part of this function. Here is the recursive base case. We're done when the input variable is zero. First, the stack is adjusted and the return address is saved. We do this in all cases. Then we do a branch if equal to compare the input argument with zero and jump to the L6 label if X is zero, where we restore the return address from the stack adjust the stack base to where it was, and return. Let's proceed if x is not zero. We start by calculating x and one, putting the result in a caller saved temporary register t0. Then we store the result to the stack so that we can get it back after the recursive calls return to this stack frame. We don't need the value of x anymore, so now just shift the input argument by one in a zero to get the recursive call argument. Now we make the recursive call, but the value of x and 1 will not be in t0 when the recursive call returns. So after the return, we have to restore the value of x and 1 
from where we previously saved it on the stack. We'll put the value back in T0 again. Then we add that value to the return value from the recursive call to P count R. Just like with the base case, we have to restore the return value from the stack and adjust the stack pointer back to the top of the caller's frame, and then we can return. You may like to walk through a small example and keep track of the values in the stack and registers. For example, try to track through what happens when pcountr is called with an initial argument of 4. That wraps up our introduction to writing basic RISC-V assembly language. This should be sufficient for you to be able to read and write basic assembly programs. Operating system and compiler writers go deeper still. Happy hacking!